What's going on, Internet? I'm Christopher Peterson, and you're listening to a Nerd EXP interview. This week, I'm hanging out with Kevin Stallard from Dragon Con. Hey, Kevin, how's it going? It's going well. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, Dragon Con is just a few weeks away. I'll be attending uh, with media. I uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity. Uh, if people are listening to this and want to know what Dragon Con is, is it still possible for people to buy tickets for this year? Absolutely. Uh, we do on-site registration. I believe, actually, paradoxically, it's not possible to buy tickets online anymore. I think you, the, fr- from this point going forward, so close to the convention, you'll have to buy them on-site. But there is no ticket cap. Uh, we don't sell out. So you can come down to the convention um, even as late as Monday and, and buy a one-day pass to attend the convention. So uh, it's wide open. Come on down. All right. That's fantastic. Uh, so for what would people be interested in? Uh, so let's jump into kind of what Dragon Con is and what they can look forward to if you're listening to this. And if you're listening to it and Dragon Con's already passed, Dragon Con's annual. It will be annual from here until the end of the universe. So even if this is uh, three years in a time capsule, definitely check out Dragon Con. It's a wonderful experience. So, Kevin, from your perspective, like what's kind of like the elevator pitch for Dragon Con for fans? Uh, for years, we have billed ourselves as the largest – uh, popular culture sci-fi fantasy convention in the known universe. Uh, it depends on whether or not you count San Diego. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, it, it, you know, without getting into the numbers of who, who's bigger than what, we have about uh, anywhere between sixty and seventy thousand fans uh, descend on Dragon Con every Labor Day weekend. Um, we take up five hotels and the Atlantic Convention Center in America's Mart, so I guess that's seven buildings now. Um, but it's just, if there's anything nerd related that you're interested in, chances are we have something to do with it from video games to star Wars, to Asian culture, to, uh, we even have something called the war college where military geeks can get together and look at antique, uh, artillery pieces and things like that. It's, we have something for everybody. That's fantastic. And I know there's a lot of different disciplines and kind of like even touched upon video gaming and board gaming and Star Wars. Uh, What's kind of your primary focus at Dragon Con? I'm the director of video game programming. So if it's got a computer chip running it and it's a game, uh, it's mine, which everything from coin ops to consoles to PC games to uh, mobile games, it's pretty much all in my sphere of influence. How did you get tapped for that? And like, what's kind of your background? And like, if somebody wanted to do something similar, like, you know, what's the opening path of, or, you know, even just to be a volunteer? Well, to be a volunteer, it's easy. You, uh, we have three volunteer meetings throughout the year. Uh, the easiest way to get to where you want to go as a volunteer, whether you want to work with a parade or security or whatever, is to show up at one of those meetings, talk to the director and say, Hey, I want to work for you. Um, that's the easiest way. You can also go to the website and fill out forms and things like that. Um, we have 2,200 volunteers, uh, which everybody from the chairman on down is an unpaid volunteer. I think we have two paid employees, and they're guys who work in the office and answer the phones all year. Um, but then when the convention rolls around, they turn into moder- panel moderators and do a lot of other stuff. But two paid employees out of 2,200 volunteers, is, it gives you an idea of the size and scope of the, the operation. Um, as far as how I got to be, got to run a track, uh, I'll try to keep this story as brief as I can, but the short version is I was a fan in the audience at an EverQuest panel, uh, and that was, gosh, 2002, 2001, somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, the, the people started asking questions, and the panelists started answering them, and the panelists were wrong, and uh, I, you know... <laughs> I started off respectfully correcting them, and after a while, I started getting frustrated. I'm like, guys, uh, th- this is the answer you're looking for. And, and not that the panelists were so much out of their depth, but they were asking questions behind the scenes about how customer service works and all this other kind of stuff. And I happened to be a customer service guide. <laughs> so I actually was a volunteer for EverQuest at the time. And uh, I started answering a couple questions that they couldn't answer. And one of the guys on the panel was an old buddy of mine from high school. And he recognized me. He said, well, Stallard, if you know so much about this game, get up here and grab a mic. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> they literally pulled me out of the crowd and started answering questions. And uh, I had a good time doing it. I got along with the other panelists and uh, you know, made a few new friends. And they invited me to come back and do it again next year in an, in an official capacity. So I, uh, I spoke on panels for a couple of years. And uh, 
Then World of Warcraft came out. I started speaking on that, and uh, you know, because I was in the closed beta and a few other things. And uh, finally, one of the directors just said, "Well, you're doing all these talking about these video games. Um, how would you like to do more?" And uh, so it turned into five or six panels, and eventually, uh, once I got to about ten or twelve panels, they just said, "Well, we're just going to head and give you your own track. If you can, if you can plan us twenty to twenty-five panels worth of content, you know, why don't you run this?" And they just literally pulled me out, and I volunteered to do it, and they uh, gave me a, a staff of volunteers to help me out, and I couldn't do it without them now. It's it's turned into a big thing. We're now up to 52 panels for video gaming, um, so it's kind of mushroomed over the last 10 years. And it's ba- basically I tell folks who want to get involved, get involved, jump in, go to a panel, help out. You know, find guys like me and say, hey, I want to help. I want to be part of this because um, we're all volunteers, and – I'm never one to turn down help. Even if I don't have an official staff position open, um, I'll accept the help. And then when an opening does happen, step up, volunteer, take a swing at it. Um, No fear of failure, no risk of failure. If it doesn't work, you try again next year. No, I mean, that's definitely a great story. Uh, And one thing that is interesting for my perception and for Dragon Con, it is kind of a mix of fan panels and expertise panels and guest panels, guests being uh, people in the industry itself or, or kind of have that background information. How do you juggle that? How does you know a group of fans prove knowledge enough to get a panel at the convention? Well, there's a good side and a bad side to that. And, and this is kind of, kind of some inside baseball because I've been to a lot of fan panels where it was a disaster because the panelists had no idea what they were doing. Um, what I tell people and this is kind of what I did when I was a panelist, is I realized that people didn't pay for a badge at Dragon Con to come see me talk. And the way you get popular with a geek crowd is to incite and provoke discussion. In a lot of ways, it it was like the early days of social media. I would phrase things kind of in the form of a question and then let the fans come back at me with their questions and their comments, and we started a dialogue with an audience and the more involved you got the audience, the more interested they were because people love talking about the things they're interested in. So when you get the fans asking lots of questions and making points and counterpoints and really kind of at that point, you're less of a a panelist speaking at the audience than you are a facilitator of discussion. And there have been panels where I'll look at one guy in the crowd and say, okay, this guy over here said this, what do you think? And I'm just directing the discussion. And uh, I'll, you know, people come up to me afterwards, man, you were a great panelist. I'm like, I didn't say anything. <laughs> Y'all did all the work. <laughs> and uh, for fan panels, that's really the approach you want to take. Um, nobody cares what you have to say. You're the guy that gets the discussion starting. And that's really kind of the secret to being a moderator is you're not the star of the show. And when you have a guest, again, the moderator is not the star of the show. I'm there to start a discussion with the guest or with the panelist and then let the audience get involved and, and, and start that back and forth. And uh, I, I find that's an approach that works really well for me. Um, the challenge is when you have the huge media, you know, you have Felicia Day in a room of 2,000 people, not everybody gets a turn. And that, that, ha- that you have to be a little more direct and, and treat it more like, a, like an interview. Hit the questions that you know, you know, seventy percent of the people out in the crowd want answers to, and then let the fans fill in the gaps. Sure, absolutely. Sounds like you have a great approach when talking to fans and guests. Uh, for people who want to hear more from you, are there any panels that you know you're moderating this year? Uh, about five or six. I think the first one I'm doing is at eleven thirty on Friday. It's called the uh, Psychology of Online Bullying. We brought in a behavioral psychologist and a community rep from from uh, high res who does Smite, and we're talking about what the thought process is involved when you see people bullying online and, and their motives for saying the things they say, and, and uh, you know just because you drop an n bomb on somebody doesn't mean you're a racist. It means you're you're picking at what you perceive to be an easy target. And, and, and what the real psychological motivations are, because I think there are a lot of misconceptions, in the, particularly in social media, that if you use a certain insult 
that that is an issue for the person doing the insulting and and that's really not it and i think when you understand why and how online trolls do what they do it's easier to combat that and uh, i think that's going to be a really lively discussion yeah no that sounds really interesting that's an approach that i've never thought of as far as low-hanging fruit of insults is why we kind of hear you know kind of the that nigger or gay or your mom not necessarily because those people have a problem with that if you were to ask them intellectually but they just kind of see it as easy pot shots or maybe even just mimicking behavior that they've seen from media or media trolls or other people uh, in their troll community well and i think when you look at somebody getting into an online community you know somebody on twitter or or in game chat or whatever you don't really appreciate how many tells you give about what kind of person you are. I mean, starting with your character and your avatar name, if you come across as cute girl, well, then my range of possible insult, you sound fat, get back in the kitchen, rape jokes. You know, I mean, there are a whole list of things that, okay, if I see female, well, that makes a whole menu of jokes or, or insults available to me. Where if you come across as Jose Chavez, well, there's a whole different menu of insults available at that point. And I think people do this subconsciously without even realizing they're doing it. No, that's great. Uh, and it also, I think, kind of proves to the wide range of information and discussions available at Dragon Con that it's not – and these are important and people like these, but it's not just pulling out a great voice actor uh, and just you know having them on stage tell anecdotes. It's also talking about the culture and philosophy and kind of behind the scenes of why people game and why people do what they do. Yeah, and, and I think what I find really – you talk about voice actors. What I find really voice, uh, fascinating about them – is you want them to have their Q and A opportunity because you know, and I'll use Felicia Day as an easy example. Is she, her, you know, her new memoir just came out, and of course she wants to talk about her book and her experiences, and and, and you know, it's work in a sense for them too. And, and you provide that forum for them because that's you know that's kind of part of the quid pro quo for getting guests. By the same token, when you have these other discussions, like we have one about. Uh, creating or, or developing stories for video games. And Felicia came to us behind the scenes and said, I really want to moderate this panel. This is something I'm really interested in. I'm not a video game writer, but I would love to moderate the panel. So she comes back and says, I would love to do this other stuff for the convention. You know, And, and so in a way, it, it kind of brings her more into the family, so to speak. And we have a you know, voice actor, Dino Andrade, he wants to talk about his experiences working on World of Warcraft. He says, I'd also like to do a one-day workshop teaching fans how to be a voice actor and how to develop characters and do that kind of stuff. So guests are great in that you, th there's easy content, but then they have ideas for other content they'd like to see because they're fans too. And you know, it, it's all, it's like a it's a force multiplier in a way. It's like when you get the easy panel and then, oh, they have this other great idea that they'd like to do too, and that's bonus content for us. That sounds amazing. Is there a particular theme or kind of unifying structure for this year's video game program content? Or is it just, you know, not just, but is it more focused on getting the best conversations and best panels together? Or is there kind of an overarching message that connects a lot of the panels and discussions? Not really. Uh, the video gaming is too diverse. It's too big. Um, I think one of the, the gripes we get, and it's justified, is somebody will come in, and Minecraft is a popular example. Fans go, why, why don't you have a Minecraft panel? Because I don't have anybody who can talk about it. <laughs> you know, we, we tried to get the guys from Mojang to come and talk about Minecraft. We couldn't get them. None of my guys, none of my volunteers are feel comfortable enough with the subject matter to get up there in front of a room full of 200 people and talk about Minecraft. But if we had somebody who was, I'd have a Minecraft panel. <laughs> And and so a lot of it's catch as catch can. You know, if you have an opportunity, you take it. Like you know, you find out that Lord British is coming to Dragon Con. Well, yeah, we're going to have panels on Ultima and Shroud of the Avatar and all the stuff that he does because we have a guest. We have somebody that can talk about that. So we, tr with the wide variety of programming and video games, uh, there's just 
it, it would be way the degree of difficulty would be way too high to have an overarching theme. So we, we try to cast that net as broadly as we can, but we know that it's not possible for us to cover everything every year. So we kind of make a point of changing it up. Uh, the fan fra- favorites are coming back year after year because as long as they're drawing the crowds, we'll, we'll keep having it. And then uh, we take some chances elsewhere. You know, we have uh, some indie studio guys coming out that want to talk about their new game, and maybe it takes off, maybe it doesn't. But we we try to leave room on the schedule for the new guys to come in and see if they can make an impact. And sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So, you know, people out there might be listening and be like, man, you know, I would love to get a, my favorite people, my favorite developers, voice actors, and industry knowledge in the house and have them talk about what I want to talk about. Uh, how difficult is it to be the director of video game programming? Is this a, <laughs> and, you, and you talk about being a volunteer gig, is this really a year long job? Oh, absolutely. I've, I've already started for 2016. Um, and I say started, I've, I have had potential guests contact me. It's like, we know it's three weeks before the show. We can't get, make it this year. Can we do something for next year? Um, by the way, my typical response on that is, "I will. You're on my list. I will talk to you in November. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want at least a month off." Um, but it's, it, yeah, it really never ends. Um, typically, you know, I talked about the earlier before we started recording about the various phases of uh, planning a track. Uh, once the convention is over, you know, we have after action reports, we count attendance, we look at, you know, which panels worked and which ones didn't. And then the very first thing I do is kind of do it, uh, you know, okay, here's a draft schedule for next year, the events that we know we're bringing back. Um, assuming that we have no guests, here's what we want to do. And then we start filling in gaps and it, it's slow until about January. And then once January rolls around and the you know, the official Dragon Con planning season starts, uh, we start going after guests. We start all we start it all over again. And um, the longer you do it, the more efficient you get at it. So it's maybe a couple hours a week. You know, it's it's not not a huge demand on your time, but it's kind of a constant. It's constantly there, and people are constantly asking you questions. And hey, what about this game? And you know, Bungie. I, right after con last year, you know, Bungie was, was talking about destiny and that looked like it was going to be the next big thing. And we started making a real big play for Bungie and turns out they couldn't make it. And, you know, now it's all but fallen off the radar. So you never know how it's going to go. And it's one of those, you always have to keep an eye on the industry and you know, what's big, what's getting big, what's coming up. Um, that part never really ends. So of the guests who attend, how many do you, like what's the percentage do you think of people who ask to be in Dragon Con or people that you guys actively go after? Well, it's a double edged sword. Um, first of all, and this is one of the the insider things that I think is helpful for everybody knows. Every guest Dragon Con has, from William Shatner on down, everyone puts in an application to Dragon Con. Um, we don't contact people out of the blue and say, you know, here's your airfare and hotel and you know. You have to get in the system. You have to go through the process, which means going in front of the guest committee, having them decide, you know, this is a guest, an attending professional. This guy is worth a badge only. This guy gets a hotel room and airfare. You know, there's all that stuff that has to get decided. So everybody goes through that process. When we talk to the gaming studios, a lot of it's built on relationships. Uh, you know, Mike Caps, former CEO of Epic Games, um, works with me, and he knows a lot of the guys in the business. So when the convention season kind of gets started around the first of the year, he's going around to all these game development con- conventions, talking to his contacts and his people, and finding out which studios have the cycles to send somebody and that sort of thing. And that's how we get a lot of guys from BioWare and, and things like that. Is we have our own industry contacts, and they say, hey, you know, we, we have some p- folks we'd like to send to Dragon Con. We, you know, tell them we have them put in an app. We run them through the ringer, and I, I, try, I got to walk those applications through. And then I tell the guest committee, you know, these are guys we really want, or, or yeah, this guy's interesting, but there's not really anything we can do with him this year uh, kind of thing. And, you know, some years, some developers are hot and some aren't. Um, and that's just, you know, that's kind of at some point you have to make a decision. We can only have 400 guests for the entire convention. So not everybody who applies can get in this year. But so, some folks would decide, OK, they, they need a year off or, you know, there, there's a lot of consideration that goes on behind the scenes. But everybody goes through the same process. 
No, it's great to know that it's a level playing field for uh, everyone. Everybody has a chance to kind of have their voices heard. Uh, I'll say this much to potential guests, if, 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 and this is a discussion I've had with some online YouTube personalities. I don't want to name names, but um, when you're filling out the application, don't assume that everybody knows who you are. Because uh, we, we had the, the story that we had this year, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to name names here, but Michael McConaughey um, applied to be a guest, and, and you, that might not be a name that's, you know, first and foremost in your mind, and he said, well, I've done various voices in World of Warcraft. Well, when you're looking at movie stars, and, and you, said you, were, you played various roles, you think, you know, town villager number 27 and troll number two. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, this, you know, this guy's nobody. And um, the guest committee respectfully declined at first, and I, I went back and saw the list of applications, and I saw that name, and, you know, a couple of Key clicks later, I was like, wait a minute, this guy was the voice of the Lich King, the voice of Deathwing, <laughs> you know, the voice of Kelthor, I mean, voice of major characters in World of Warcraft. And I go back to the guest committee, he's like, guys, you need to get this guest. And if he wants a hotel room, give it to him. Um, you know, it, it, and when, once I explained the scale of it all, the guest committee was quick to act, you know, they, we fixed the situation and he's coming to Dragon Con this year. But it, it's the kind of thing that, if the application had gone just to me, yeah, I would have known who he was. But the guest committee manages 40 tracks worth of guests, and they have to know everything from every TV show, every movie, every book, every video game. It's not possible to have expertise in all of it. So when I tell somebody, you know, when somebody says they're an online YouTube personality, you know, thousands of people have YouTube channels. But if you can come back and say, I have. 2 million unique subscribers or it gives some idea of the size and scope of who you are and what you do. It's a lot more likely that your application is going to get a closer look. Uh, so that would be my advice to anybody out there listening to this who says, Hey, I'd like to be a guest. I do some stuff. Be specific. You know, if, if you're an author, try to give an idea of how many books you've sold. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, we all know who Jim Butcher is, but you know, there's some up and coming folks. You can't possibly keep up with everything. So I, I tell folks, you know, nobody's as famous as they think they are. <laughs> tell tell your story. No, that, that's definitely great to hear. Uh, for this coming up uh, 2015 lineup, what do you think fans will be most excited for? <sighs> uh, I know I'm asking you to pick your favorite baby. It, it, in a way. Uh, my opinion, and this is just me talking, um, the Star Wars track is going to have a huge year. I mean, oh, absolutely. He's coming out. It's a good time to be a Star Wars fan. Um, I think if you're into Arrow uh, and Stephen Amell, that's that's a huge get for us. And, and I, I think with that show gaining popularity, I think he's going to be a huge draw. Um, Felicia, with her book coming out, you know, Felicia always packs the place. Uh, I, I love Felicia Day to pieces. Um, she's going to do a lot of stuff talking about Geek and Sundry, talking about her book, um, moderating the panel on writing for video games, which I th think was a, a good coup for us. And uh, I, you know, when she started coming to Dragon Con, we were concerned we weren't going to be able to get her on a video gaming panel at all. And now we've got her for three. So I, I'm ecstatic to be working with her. Um, aside from that, gosh, um, I think the big sneaky, uh, draw that we really haven't made a lot of hay about, but once people get to the convention, they're going to notice is we have the developers of Firefly online. And, uh, I think a video game about the Firefly universe is going to really be a pleasant surprise for a lot of our fans. I'm looking forward to seeing that crowd reaction. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Uh, Firefly is definitely one of my favorite, uh, Firefly Online, I hope, will right. turn out better than what I've seen. Uh, but, you know, I can definitely see uh, that world and that lore kind of polishing some, some rough spots. I, I, the, the possibilities are endless, right? You know, I mean, you have all, Star Citizen is another one. The hopes are sky high. I want it to be the next huge thing. And I... I think at this point, having panels on games like that does a couple things. One, it lets the developers know that we're out there and we're watching, uh, which I think help it. It helps them, encourages them to put out the best game they can. Uh, the other part of it is I think it does a reasonable job of setting expectations. I think if your developers are out there, it's like, this is what we're working on. This is what we're up to. 
um, it can make a big difference with fans, especially if they feel like they have any kind of input whatsoever into the process. Um, if they feel like the, the, the community reps are listening to the audience and, hey, we think this is a really good idea or a really bad idea, um, that goes a long way. Yeah, I, th- I think with the rise of crowdfunding, we're also seeing a rise of crowd sourcing, crowd testing. Yep. I don't know if there's a, a niche term for this yet, but, you know, kind of the, the fan feedback and kind of cycle loop of beta testers and alpha testers that aren't just in-house but are kind of from that pool of your most hardcore fans out there. Well, it, it's funny because I actually came up uh, – I worked as a QA developer for so- a security software company for a number of years. And it's one thing to have people who know your product inside and out beating on it in kind of a scripted, targeted fashion. It's another thing to throw it out there to a couple million people and say, here it is, beat it up. (laughs) Right. I mean, there's really no substitute for that. And um, I think if managed well, it can result in a much better end product. Um, I think even though a lot of your, your quote unquote beta testers think, oh, this is a free sneak preview of a game, it is. But even just you playing the game is providing data to the developers, you know, looking at patterns of behavior, looking at, okay, we designed a quest to work this way. Here's what the user is doing. Here are the, the stumbling blocks. Here's the areas where they get confused and things need to be worded better. There's all kinds of data that just playing the game provides that is valuable to game developers. And I think they're getting better at taking advantage of that. Sorry, that kind of came across as preachy, but um, I, it, there's definitely a role for it. No, no, not at all. Uh, from DragonCon, you, you've been a, you know, a fan, you've been a director, you've been a volunteer. Who's kind of one of the most memorable guests that you've had a chance to interact with? Oh, my. And, um, and right now you're thinking of all the guests that might potentially listen to this, and you're like, oh, I don't want to insult anybody. Well, no, I mean, there was the time I got stuck on an elevator with George Takei. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, well, I was... Like, what do you mean stuck like that? Elevator broke? Well, I say, because, you know, those hotels are 40 stories, and you, you, there's no such thing as a short elevator ride right, right. at yeah, Dragon Con. Point. And uh, I was recovering from the night before and not really paying attention to my surroundings as well as I should have been and um, stumbling onto an elevator. And I turn around kind of without looking and I hear from behind me, are you having a nice time? You know, just about (laughs) jumped out of my – because there's only one voice that sounds like that and just about jumped out of my skin and stammered, uh, uh, yes, Mr. K, are you having a nice time? And call me George, you know. It was just a very kind of you know we had a nice little chit chat going up the elevator. Um, I've had you know so many I've met so many of the celebrities there and and they've all been incredible nice genuine people, which you wouldn't think that's possible. But um, a lot of the folks that we get, especially the ones that come back to DragonCon year after year after year, um, they really do kind of feel like part of the family. You know, they get DragonCon and. The convention is different than any other beast. You know, it's not like a Comic Con where you know the celebrities are under contract. They show up, they do their panel, they get back in their limo, and they go home and they get paid five figures for it. That's not how Dragon Con rolls, and it, it's um, very pleasant to watch the the first time guests who come there and and see everything for the first time and really when once it sinks in and they get it and they the first thing they say is i can't wait to come back next year um that's the biggest validation a, a volunteer or a director could ever have is you know we've done it you know somebody else has fallen in love with dragon con as much as i love it and i'm always thrilled to see that that's fantastic, and yeah, I, I agree with you uh, that fans can see through it, and you know you can only put on a facade. So I mean, if you're out there interacting, shaking hands, doing Q and A sessions, like you're more, you're a genuinely good person, uh, and like you know you're out there and and, and you want to be. I mean, you can't go to Dragon Con and you know expect people not to say hi to you uh, if you have a recognizable name and face. So I think yeah. that if you put yourself out there, you know you're willing to do that and willing to and wanting to meet kind of your most diehard and you know clientele well i uh i gotta give a, a special shout out to richard garriott because i've been playing video games for almost 40 years and uh 
he was an idol. You know, it was very close to a fanboy moment the first time I got to meet him. And the thing I love about his panels is he'll come and he'll do his panel, he'll do his Q and A, and he will stick around afterwards and talk to anyone and everybody that wants to ask him a question about anything. Uh, he makes himself available for fans and genuinely loves the experience of, of that one-on-one -on -one interaction, even if it's just for a few minutes. And uh, it, it's kind of nice to be able to hang out with your heroes and your inspirations. And you know, I, like I said, I, I think I played my first Ultima game. Oh gosh, thirty years ago. Wow. Well. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's definitely me. huge, and I'm glad that you had that opportunity. Uh, and if you're out there listening, maybe your hero is going to be a Dragon Con this year or next year. So definitely check it out. Uh, I know that Dragon Con does grow more each year. It seems to be like 65,000 people mm -hmm. or more, uh, you know, people coming day one attending this year. I, and there's a lot. There's fan panels, guest panels, um, a lot of going in at the same time. You know, I apologize, but like five, seven hotels, a lot of space to cover. Do you have any like tips and tricks for people attending for the first time or you know maybe even just kind of good general pointers that maybe people need to be refreshed on? Uh my my favorite do not do not do not do not do not expect to see everything DragonCon has to offer in one year. It's not possible. Um a lot of times, thing, you know, really good events are scheduled at the same time. Yeah, for example, people love to come to the Heroes and Villains Ball at Dragon Con, but Here Come the Mummies is playing a concert at the same time in a different hotel. And uh, it's – I would focus on unique experiences. Like when you have a musical guest that you're not sure is coming back next year, take the time and go see them because the party is going to be there every year. And, and understand that they, there are some guests – that have come to Dragon Con many times, and you know you'll get a chance to see them again. And then there are unique opportunities where you're not sure when, if you're going to see them again. Um, I think that was one of the things about Shatner and Nimoy a couple of years ago is when they came to Dragon Con and were on a panel together doing a Q and A. That the reason that drew such an enormous crowd is everybody kind of understood. Hey, you know these guys are pushing eighty. They're on the stage at the same time, in the same place. You're not going to have a whole lot of opportunities to see that again. So pick a few things that are your absolutely must-sees, and then the others if you can get to it, because you'll have a chance next year. Uh, don't feel like you have to do it, all, do it all in one year. It's just not possible. No, that's definitely great advice. Uh, if you guys are interested in DragonCon, check out dragoncon.org to see who's attending in 2015 or 2016, depending on when you're listening to this. Uh, there is a DragonCon app, which updates with the schedule as events get closer, so that way you can try and plan out and maybe maximize those unique opportunities. If you're more interested in the video game track, there is a, a separate site for videogaming.com, sorry, videogaming.dragoncon.org. Uh, you can also pick it up off dragoncon.org. Uh, if you're in the Atlanta area or willing to make the drive or the flight, uh, definitely check it out uh, this Labor Day weekend. Thank you, Kevin, for your time. Definitely appreciate you kind of running through what people can look forward to at this DragonCon and every year, kind of some inside scoop. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to call out for people? Uh, yeah, there's one other thing I'd like to say. We know a lot of uh, folks like to come down for the parade on Saturday. Uh, you know, they may not want to attend all four days of the convention, but they want to come down for the parade. The way that the parade route for this year has just been announced, and I want to tell folks, if you're living in town and don't want to deal with the parking and all the stuff that comes with trying to get a good spot to watch the parade, uh, the North Avenue MARTA station is probably your best bet for uh, taking the subway to get down close to the parade route. It drops off about a block from the parade route. Uh, that's if, if you want to get a good spot and you don't want to get down there at 6 a.m., that's the approach I'd take. Perfect. Uh, follow DragonCon on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I'm Chris Peterson. I will be at DragonCon. If you see me, if you happen to know what I look like, say hi. Uh, Kevin will say hi if he can, but he'll probably be running around doing 23-hour days, uh, making sure that everything runs smoothly. Catch me if you can. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Kevin. I appreciate you taking the time out, especially with only 11 days to go. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thank you guys out there for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this interview and that we were able to help you with your Dragon Con IQ. Level up, friends.